Welcome to Universal Furniture. Welcome to Learning Center. We've had a number of events uh, here in the space and uh, have a few more uh, tomorrow and Monday as well. And all the events that we have here, we do record. So if you've missed anything, uh, we will send that out to you if you registered with us. Um, and if not, uh, just let the front desk know and we'll get your information and we can send you that link. Um, Universal, uh, the space itself, I have a few things to say just to pay for this, but um, so uh, the building itself is massive, three floors. Uh, we have a lot of new products. Uh, our newest introduction, Modern, is on floor three. Uh, first floor, we have special order upholstery, a new special order upholstery dining program that we have with dining chairs. Great in-stock looks on floor two. And to get to floors two and three, I've been asked numerous times today, there's an elevator. So you can take the stairs if you want to get your steps in, uh, or you can take the elevator. Uh, also downstairs, we have the Designer's Lounge, which is uh, sponsored by our good friends at Rue. And there's a lot of fun activations in there. Yes, thank you. Um, so to see anything uh, afterwards or to get a cocktail afterwards, just step into the front desk, uh, just uh, get scanned in, and then you will be on your way. So I'm going to hand it off to Kelly Lamb. Kelly is the editor-in-chief? Yes. yes. And, and a number of things. Yeah. Yes. Many yes. Kelly does pretty much everything for Rue. Um, and, um, well, almost everything, so, but I'm going to hand it over to Kelly and uh, talk about our, our friends here with Cupcakes and Cashmere and their pop-up, uh, which is also in the atrium, and that's why it smells so good, so they'll speak a little to that as well, so, Kelly, and if nothing else, this will be entertaining, so. <laughs> Thank you, Neil, and also definitely stop into uh, the Designer Lounge, uh, which is next door. Danny Seal with Rue Magazine does a lot. <laughs> And it's put together some really amazing gift bags with a lot of our favorite products. You can get the recent issue of the magazine. So I think we've, we've covered the hour. Good. Okay. <laughs> well, as Neil said, I'm Kelly. Uh, if you're not familiar with Rue, we're a quarterly design magazine. Emily was our cover star last summer, I think. Yes. And today we're here with Emily and her husband, Jeffrey. I mean, I'd love to go back to the beginning. If you're not familiar, she's sort of the original influencer. Um, with the launch of Cupcakes and Cashmere. <laughs> so I'd love to take it back to the early days. Yeah, thank you. I'm thrilled to be here. This is my first time here and um, it's overwhelming and fantastic. And um, yeah, we started, um, or I guess I started Cupcakes and Cashmere in 2008 and was kind of one of the, as you said, like OG blogger influencers in the space. I was really bored at my day job and just decided to do something on the side that kind of encapsulated everything that I was passionate about, kind of started with fashion and food, hence the alliterative name, and then kind of expanded beyond that with beauty and interior design and just kind of a little bit of everything. And it's just grown since then. And I know we spoke about it a little earlier. What was your day job at that time? So at that time, my day job, I was a sales assistant at AOL. Um, and uh, was like America Online. Yeah, America Online, if you need a little context. And um, this was one of my clients. Uh, Jeffrey and I worked together. We got the like go ahead from my boss at the time that it was OK to um, date my client. Um, but I was managing online media campaigns. Yeah. Yeah, that was really it. <laughs> and you were originally with Domino. Is that correct? I was my first job. I've heard of it. Yeah. So my first job right out of college was at Condé Nast and I worked for both Teen Vogue and Domino magazines. And at the time when I first started working with Domino, um, it literally hadn't even launched yet. So I was like, I don't know, this sounds kind of cool. And I was going to all these events. I knew nothing about design and interior design and, and just got to be a fly on the wall, essentially, at so many meetings and just tried to like absorb as much as I could. But it was a very, a very cool place to to get kind of my feet wet, I guess. And then as the blog, I mean, did you feel like it was overnight success or what was the growth period like as you were starting out? A absolutely not. There was nothing overnight about it. I think like in, in this day and age, you can go on TikTok and have something go viral. And like the next day, you're like a household name. That was certainly not the case. It was a um, it was a slow trajectory um, and I, I wouldn't want it any other way. Um, but it was like a very lovely place back in the day. Like 2008 internet was very supportive and, um, and you know, things, the, the landscape has changed slightly since then, but it was, it was a, a gradual. So we shouldn't, the dark underbelly. <laughs> no, that, that's went. another, you can go on social media today and see all of that. Yeah. And I guess I'm curious, so many people in this room likely started their business also as like an escape from their day job, a passion for something that they were creative about. 
what were some of the steps you took to start monetizing or to start making it more than just something fun? Like, and it was so early. How did you know that there was a career there? I didn't at first. And, um, you know, it, it was really just a hobby. It was something that I was doing that I was passionate about, that I loved to share. I think one of the things that set me apart was consistency. Um, I just wrote every single day and made sure to have a blog post go up um, every single day of the work week um, and just tried to develop my voice and, and kind of find certain like themes and patterns that would emerge. But, um, you know, I think to anyone who is trying to do something on their own, you need to be really passionate about it. I think it's different in this day and age because people start things and those hobbies have the intention or hope of turning into something in, in which it can be an actual career. But at the time, that was just like a thing I was doing and Jeffrey was pretty integral. I mean, what you gave me like advice, like I feel like it had to do with like even paid views that you were like, if you get to this or something. Like I mean, the back end is we work both in ad sales. So we understand the metrics and how to sell our product. Um, and I gave her like some random number. I was like, if you get a million page views a month, we can begin monetizing this to the point where it'll equal your annual salary, your, your monthly salary at AOL. And that was the initial goal. You know, just have a target, you know, a benchmark and go from there. And we hit that pretty within six to eight months of working together. Yeah. And then you were laid off. <laughs> Well, well, to clarify, there was a voluntary layoff uh, at AOL, uh, which I took. Um, and it, it was like one of the bigger decisions of my life. I was so petrified. And I am a big proponent of, you know, the belief that like any big career change, any big change, honestly, in your life um, will probably like scare the shit out of you. And it should. Um, but the moment that I then finally made that decision, and this was like literally clicking like yes or no on a computer screen, I waited to the last minute and I clicked like, yes, I'm, I'm going to leave. And, but the minute I did it, I just knew. And I was like, this is, this is the right thing. And, and more than anything, and this is some of the best advice that like I've been given and that I give to other people is that you need to believe and just invest in yourself. And, and so you have to be your biggest cheerleader. So that was kind of my first big leap. Well, that's a great note to end on. <laughs> <laughs> That's like so insightful. It's like the perfect. It's true. You have to have like when you're faced with those, it's like it's this major thing or what or continuing down the same mm -hmm. possibly boring road. So very boring. Uh, I love that it was like a compute like. Yeah. It's very. Like on, it was like Christmas. Well, it was like. Yeah. I mean, we're about to go. I didn't like get to say goodbye to my coworker. It's like none of us liked each other, but like it was fine. But like it felt weird just being like, but like slipping out the back door and stuff. It felt like a little creepy, but. I um, imagine they're still keeping up with you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, who knows? So was that the point? When did you join the team, Jeffrey? I was always in the back uh, of, I mean, every picture you've seen of her, I've pretty much <laughs> taken. So I've been working on this since day one, but. Officially, I joined just over 10 years ago, full time. Um, and that was a choice I made because I also didn't really like my day job anymore. But um, we had reached the point in our business where we had diversified enough of our of our business, just not from content, but to commerce and to other brand partnerships that um, it made financial sense for us to kind of push forward and become a team of two, which then became a team of three. So now a team of 10. Um, but it just it was a progressive thing five years into the entire, you know, experiment, if you will, which is now no longer an experiment. I'm curious about like that diversification of the business. What were there any points or like, how did you step back and decide like, this is, we should pursue e-commerce or we should like, what was, what did that look like? Did you see a change in the industry and know that you kind of had to evolve or? Absolutely. When we first started, the, the only way that we were monetizing was with banner ads. Like if you remember those, like, you know, it's 728 by 90 and a 300 by 250. That's literally what I used to do at AOL all day. And so I was just, you know, selling those. Um, and then we, we started to get like brand partnerships. I had a bag that I designed with coach and they reached out and I was like, oh, this could be something that we do down the line as well. And wasn't that, that was like for the fashion blogging industry, that really changed the way that that entire industry went forward with like collapse yeah, and very much so i think it was the first of its kind and they just put this trust um and i think it really gave a sense of legitimacy to what you know we were just bloggers at the time but they saw the um you know the impact of if we were featuring something and seeing the clicks and seeing all the acquisition all the things that that we were doing 
Um, and they were the first brand to like really, you know, understand that. So that was a big turning point. But as you know, as things have progressed away from just websites to social media and different partnerships, and um, it was a very natural progression for us to then have our own line. We've had a clothing line and a shoe line and, um, you know, and then to have our own e-commerce. I've always seen myself as a curator. So finding things that I loved um, to wear or a great recipe or whatever it is and and just finding a place then to house all of my favorite things, um, you know, and then which most recently um, with Lavoon, which is right around the corner. If you want to go smell it, those those are candles that we're, we're very happy with. And, um, you know, but that's kind of been part of part of the progression, I guess. I let's I would like to go back, but we should definitely talk about Lavoon specifically right now, because did everyone not notice how good it smelled in here? <laughs> And what sparks that? I'd love to know the backstory and how you really kickstarted that, because that has been a new successful extension of the brands. But it's also, you know, it was a big swing to not just have it be called Cupcakes and Cashmere, I think. Yeah. So scent has always just been enormously impactful and a big thing in, in my life. Um, and, you know, uh, everything, I, so many memories to like of mine are connected with scent. And so we first started um offering candles, all different kinds of brands within Cupcakes and Cashmere, the shop. And um, and so that was like a natural progression as well that we saw people, you know, really appreciated and respected and trusted my vision because the the weird and hard thing about selling candles exclusively online is that no one can smell them. And so it, it takes a certain amount of trust for people to then, um, you know, feel like, oh, I understand she's talking about something that's sweet right now or that's, you know, smoky, whatever it is. So once we saw our ability to be able to, you know, have these wonderful candles, we the, the next step was just to make our own, which took several years to make happen. It definitely took a little bit longer because of that whole like COVID thing. Um, what was that word? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but we we went back and forth so many times, whether we called it Cupcakes and Cashmere as our own candle line or we called it a new name. Um, and Lavoon comes from Vunye, which is um, scent in Czech. With, scent of a pleasant nature. But good. Well, odor, I feel like, would mean like oh, okay. ne- good negative. Odor. Good odor. Yeah. No, scent to me feels like a positive thing. Um, and so we liked the idea of calling it Voon initially. Um, that was taken. So when, then we were like, well, these are hand poured in L.A., Let's add an L.A. in there. And like Lavoon kind of had like a nice like French sounding like thing going for it. So we called it Lavoon um, and came out with um, different scents that that we were really excited about. And so, yeah. It's so funny you say like having to verbally describe this. I sometimes yeah. get home tour pitches without any photos and it's just like a verbal description of them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, think about it. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. Thanks so much for reaching out. Yeah. So how have you I mean. Everything that you're talking about is all like pivot, which I'm like resisting yelling it in the Ross from friends. <laughs> but you're like constantly pivoting. How do you, is that stressful or do you enjoy the process of like your smile? Maybe this is a Jeffrey. This question. is a Jeffrey question. As a tourist, change and pivoting is like the least, I, like I sweat even thinking about having to pivot. Jeffrey, thankfully, is a good I love balance. It. I love to tear things down and rebuild. Um, the, the, we have a foundation with cupcakes. So pivoting is, it's a slight pivot. You know, to her point, we sold candles. There's a lot of trust inherent with Emily's taste. So as we developed these scents and candles and had data, I use a lot of data for decision making. I saw we could make this move to kind of increase our reach or increase our brand awareness, although we changed the brand name. Um, but there was an inherent kind of, you know, trust and, you know, kind of roadmap, if you will. Um, but I'm I'm all for, you know, moving fast and destroying things and making a, making a mess and tripping and failing just to learn because I think you learn most from failure as opposed to from success. Tell us something to our daughter. If you do really well on a test the first time, don't expect to do the same thing if you don't study or don't prepare. Um, so I said, failure is a great thing and take that for what it is. It's, it's like you learn the most from, from your mistakes. And so we've had a few, you know, I don't talk about our shoes, but that was a big mistake. Um, shoes? Yeah. I was going to say, if you were open to sharing failures, yeah, it was actually so less inspiring to hear. Yeah, absolutely. And it was less about like the design and like how they're made and like our retail partners. It was like, it was our, our manufacturer, more of our yeah. manufacturer. And, and that's the problem is that like when you are partnering with people, so much of that comes down to like, you know, who you have surrounded yourself by, like and who you can trust and that kind of thing. But you make those mistakes. And I think one of the more challenging aspects of those decisions that then result in like 
kind of like big like blow ups in your face is that then you're not always in a position to share that, which then can kind of come across as like, oh, she's not being very open when there are like a lot of different reasons behind it. But legal reasons, legal, literal legal reasons. But um, no, there have been a lot of mistakes that we have made. Um, and then, then there are other ones that we narrowly avoided. Every time we're at LAX, I remember and like no shade on anyone who has a little like kiosk at the airport in L.A., but one of our brand partners was like, you know, it would be great for cupcakes and cashmere is to have your own little like booth here. And I was like, by like the Hudson News, like, is that, you know, and we avoided that one. And every time I'm at the airport, I'm like, we could have been there. So like, you know, right by like the hot dog. So I feel like um, there have been a lot of like, you know, things where you have to, as Jeffrey said, you make mistakes and and learn a lot of it too comes down to instinct and gut. I know that's like a, it sounds almost like, you know, try it like but. It really, you know, if you feel like there's either someone with whom you are not vibing or you just like get a weird feeling, trust that because the times where we have had things that have not worked out, a lot of it, I was like, well, yeah, it felt a little weird. And the worst is when you're looking back and you're like, I knew it. Yeah, yeah like, you know, so, but that, again, yeah. then all you can do is like learn and moving forward, like, you know, you don't work with those kinds of people anymore. <laughs> hopefully yes <laughs> from like from that entrepreneurial side who like what would you suggest for people who are just getting started like is it having you know a great lawyer a great accountant is it all of it or like what are the most important things or the things that are most valuable to help the business continue to run and grow I mean I I believe a good lawyer is, is essential <laughs> I mean we've encountered enough things in, in our business to know that um Issues happen. Things come up a lot. I think investing in a lawyer is is a great expense um, and a great investment. But I mean, as far as forming a business, I mean, you need to have a, obviously a vision and some kind of ability to manage your capital. You know, it's not always easy to like you know spend and not have any results right away. So having a a budgetary plan, a a business plan, um, you know, laid out that you can survive for six months without having any sales because we've been there. You know, and it's it's. It's not easy. I mean, this during during COVID, there was a time where sales were kind of quiet for a bit, and then they picked up again. But there was a moment where you have to kind of realize that you can't always predict the future, and things are going to happen, and you need to have a place that in your plan is, you know, your kind of rainy day plan. Um, but don't invest in an account; just do your own books. I mean, I, 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 unless you're a major major company, it's like I would just you know you use simple software, but a lawyer is almost indispensable. Yeah. And I, I mean, I think from more of like the creative standpoint, because that's kind of where we try to at least divide like our working relationship and then being husband and wife, um, you know, is to like find whatever your vision is, find your niche. Um, it's obviously the landscape has changed dramatically in the last 15 years since we began. But, um, you know, I like the what's the phrase you always say, like the cream always rises to the top kind of thing. Like, generic phrase Gen that, it's not like jeffrey made it up but like that he like reminds me that you know i feel like if you are doing work good work and you're consistent and you have your vision and your voice um whether that's in design or whatever it may be and and also to be patient with yourself to know that it takes time i mean i feel like i have like 12 13 years of like old-fashioned posts from the blog and i'm like huh that was a choice like where i'll look back at myself with like just you know so even like in finding my personal style or how like my writing, you know, all of those things, it takes time. So be patient with yourself as well and be open to, as we've talked about pivoting and changing and evolving, because I think that's also completely fine. I love that you look at that like old fashioned photos and you're like, that was a choice as if like thousands of girls across America weren't <laughs> copying every, and now they have those photos. Like, what? <laughs> yeah, it'll, how, it'll come back eventually. Right. I mean, give it unclear, 10 years. Some of those things. I feel like it was just a different time for fashion. It's okay. A lot of, I'm flashing back to like hot pink skinny jeans and they were really perfect. A lot and of I'm hot pink skinny jeans. Statement necklaces. Like I mean, days. but like I have a, I truly have like bulging discs. I have problems with my neck. And I think a lot of it was how big those necklaces were and just like constantly being like pulled down by those necklaces. But yeah, like little delicate like hats perched atop my, like just, yeah, there's so many things. I do need to like I need to make that a whole series of like revisiting some of my more like special looks. Like the Vogue where they flip through their old That's books. right. Yeah. I feel like my best friend and I could go on TikTok because she's constantly, she'll just send me a text with like a picture of me from like 2009. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. But yeah. 
I was there. Yeah. <laughs> well, the landscape has changed so much. Do you find it? I mean, blogging was one thing, but then like when you started, I don't think Instagram. There, no, there wasn't there was an iPhone. It didn't even exist. So it's very, I mean, we're going way back. Yeah. But yeah, Instagram didn't exist. Twitter was just starting. Facebook had been around for a bit or I just opened up to everybody a year before. So yeah. social media wasn't really, there was no landscape. A blog, we were on Blogspot. I mean, that was yeah. great software. Yeah. No, it was great software, but um, none of the apps existed because there was no ecosystem. There was no mobile takeover yet. It was all, we were on Blackberry still, for those of you who remember Blackberries. How have you, I mean, has that been intimidating or has it, have you found it easy to kind of move with? There's yeah. been nothing easy for me. I tried. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I had to force her to make an Instagram account, I don't know, 10 years ago or whatever. She yeah. was like, I don't get this. I'm like, get on it. I don't want to. Just please do it. Yeah. You for know? me, again, I think it's like my tourist mentality. I am very opposed to change and adding. Honestly, like in that case, I looked at it as like I'm cha- I'm sharing so much of my life just on this blog. Now I also am going to do the blog while also putting out new content on Instagram and then quirky, funny things on Twitter. And then over here, I'm doing video. Like, I was just like, this is so much. And I continue to feel that way. It really is just like, we're asking more and more of people, um, especially with social media. It feels sometimes like just like a 24 hour, like news cycle or like documentary of your life. So finding, finding the boundaries there has been like a new focus for me um, this year in particular. You do have a TikTok. Do you do TikTok? I do. Well? I I do TikTok in the in the way that like I spend a decent amount of time scrolling on <laughs> TikTok. Um, I do have an account of which it's not very active. I have fun anytime I do it because there is a different there's a different energy over there. It really it's funny. It's casual. It's just like it doesn't take itself too seriously. I think that has been a nice change of like Instagram. Everything was has been so curated. So. Only showing the good, picture yes. perfect. I think maybe that there's a possibility of some oversharing happening. <laughs> happening that too, yes. But uh, seeing it become more real, I think people can relate to. But do you think, I I'll speak to a lot of designers who say, I mean, a few years ago it was, do I need to have a Snapchat? Now it's, do I need to have TikTok? Do you feel you found by kind of staying in your lane has been good or is it better to kind of branch out if I'm giving advice to someone else I would probably say make that you know a something that you concentrate on um because I think it's important to show all different sides like my Instagram is a relatively curated version of my life for sure and I think I still kind of go back to that like my beginnings in like Pinterest and magazine you know like kind of the curated glossy stuff um and that's why like TikTok is so fun so I do think it's important especially for someone who's starting out that you do show different facets of what you and and just make sure it's different because I feel like if you're just going to be going on Instagram and going on TikTok and regurgitate, regurgitating the same things, that's not helpful. So find a way to be like, oh, okay, this would actually be funny, or let's use this trending audio and do this. Like I know what I would do on TikTok if I had a little bit more time. The I mean. My poor brain can't wrap like the editing software. It's a lot of work. To yeah, it is. I mean, you get it quickly. Well. Yeah. If you want to do it like um, if you want to do it well, you just have to spend a little time like figuring it out. But then again, like you over time, hopefully find your way a bit. Have you always been in? Do you have a social media team or has it always been you two? It's it's always been us or, or just me really for my social media. I recently hired someone to help kind of balance all of it more from like an organizational standpoint. But it's always been me taking the pictures, editing the video, doing all of it. So I just, I, again, comes back to a little of that control oh. that I wouldn't necessarily say is a good thing. But at the same time, it's helped me maintain a certain level of, I don't know, integrity or journalistic. Well, I don't know. I'm sure it feels, I mean, so many so many success stories are a brand and you yourself and your family is the brand. So has, how has that been challenging? How do you protect yourselves from the internet? Yeah. From, from the growth of the business as you continue to diversify the business, how are you finding that balance both as a married couple, but also, you know, it's, it's you, it's your face. Yeah. You know, I, um, I have definitely set new boundaries this year. I turned 40 earlier this year and like truly was like, okay, what, what am I getting from this? Um, what is benefiting other people? How are things contributing to our community? Um, and I kind of have that almost like in the back of my head, anytime I'm sharing things with our family more, more so for me, I'm like, man, I'm pretty numb to all of it at this point, but, 
um, you know, I will show some things with my daughter, but at the same time, she's eight years old and I want to respect her boundaries as well. And so um, and with Jeffrey as well. So my family, my friends, my actual life always comes first. Um, And then, you know, the business is a close second because that's a baby of mine as well. But I think just like set boundaries for yourself. And if you are feeling negative about anything, whether it's people you're following or like creating content, like the mute button, the mute button is really powerful. um, And you don't have to unfollow and like be seen as like mean. But like, you know, I think more than anything, you just have to take care of yourself. So like, that's the most important thing is like to maintain your own mental health. So if you're feeling anxious or down with something, just take a step back and and kind of reevaluate just so that you can continue to grow a business while taking care of yourself at the same time. And Jeffrey, you're not as, I mean, you appear on her Instagram, of course, but do you have, do you have anything to add as someone who's maybe more, not that you're in the backseat because you're (laughs) helping run everything, but as, as far as that public facing, um, how it works. I mean, I, I take it as part of the gig. So it's not like something that I'm opposed to, but I also, there are times where I say I don't want to be involved. And I think most of us grew up before phones were invented. So I'm okay, like not being involved with something and kind of doing something else. I'm just addicted to my phone as everybody else here. But um, there are times where it's like, I don't want to be part of it. And there's a struggle at times. She's like, well, this is good content or this is good. I need to do this. And so we try to find the compromise. Um, But over the, over the last 15 years, we've learned, I think, to find that balance of this is work and at a time we're going to turn off and when it's off time i'm not involved or you're not involved or i let's just kind of have these these distinct barriers or these lines because the nature of the business it's always very gray like when do we ever turn off we work from home now too since covid so it's like we're always together i mean a lot of couples they weren't together during covid and they end up breaking up during covid we were built this way so it's okay but still it's like there needs to be defined lines of when we're on when we're off when i'm involved when I'm not. And we've just worked that way for a while. So I think for us, it's, it's kind of a shorthand. It doesn't always end up, you know, pleasant, but usually it does. I mean, that could be your next best-selling book would be how to, I mean, working together, drawing, having those boundaries, like you're even saying it and I'm like moderating and I'm like, but how do you, how do you turn off? <laughs> Cause I'm working at 11. Like, how do you, is it just, has it taken training? Is it just this switch that flips? Is there, well, I know you light a candle often. to some, right? I do. Yeah, no. I mean, one of the things that I started during COVID, I think I'm a very big proponent of having traditions and rituals and things that you can kind of count on, again, to create those boundaries. And I was finding that because I no longer had like a commute after work to come home, going from like running a business to then like being a mom and like, helping with dinner and getting things like settled, like there was no in between time. So like one of the small gestures that I started doing at night was like, okay, turning off the lights in the office and closing the door, I'm turning off the computer. um, And then I'm lighting a candle to signify kind of the end of the work day. And now it's like family time. And not to say that I'll never like capture something good that Jeffrey's made for dinner or something I'm watching with Sloan, my daughter, um, but our daughter. Um, but it, it's, um, Thank you. <laughs> but, um, but it's, um, you know, I have always had pretty, um, strong boundaries within our company because I think it's really important how I, you know, I, I want to lead by example. So I hate when I remember having bosses that would be like, oh yeah, you can totally take a lunch break. And then they never take a lunch break. And you're like, I'm so sorry. Can I just like run across the street? So I feel like it's really important. Like if someone emails me all good, but I'm not going to then respond after 6 PM, I'm not going to respond until the morning. Like once work starts again. And I know it's like a tough thing, but like once then people that were part of the company saw that that was something that I was like very strict about, then they stopped emailing me at night. And same with like my, you know, our, our managers and that kind of thing. So as difficult as it is sometimes to set those boundaries, um, people ev- eventually will like begin to respect them and be like, oh yeah, she doesn't respond at night because she's with her family. I think that's so, especially sitting in a room full of designers and people who are creative and passionate about what they do and their clients like being able to have those boundaries doesn't mean that you don't love your job or you're not advancing. Absolutely not. And, you know, if I'm being like transparent, I created more of those boundaries once, you know, we we had our daughter a few years ago. Up until then, I feel like I was on the couch with the computer open. There there weren't as many. And that's also part of like 
as you're starting or, you know, just even in the midst of like your career, like, you know, there are going to be times where you are just like hustling and, and have to be working kind of like all hours. Um, and then just to make sure that you carve out time for yourself and doing whatever it is to like maintain your sanity at the same time. Um, OK, so jumping back to you being a curator, this is I always love asking people with great taste. So where here, like High Point for Designers is kind of like our bread and butter of where you go to see what's new and what's coming down, like what what trends are coming for you? Where do you go to get inspired? Where are you going to find new discoveries and any secrets you can share? Secrets. I I mean, for me, a lot of it now is online. So like finding um, other kind of influencers or designers or shop owners um, and I'll go to their accounts to see not only what they're posting, but then who they're following. That's one that's of a good tip. Yeah, that's yeah. one of my favorites because like sometimes I will find designers that I've like never even heard of. And then you go from there. It can be like a really, you know, like a slippery slope in the best way. Um, so I do love going through like other, you know, content creators um, and finding out who they're following, you know, and whatnot. And then going to shops that I love um, in and around any city, just walking around, seeing and then discovering new brands that way, going to their page and then seeing who they're following. I mean, as you can see, a lot of it comes down to social. But um, yeah, I would say those are some of my main main like little tips and tricks. Secrets. You actually I remember you also your reel of the Paris flea was very oh. But yeah, I'm sure everyone is familiar. Have you heard of the Paris flea market? <laughs> it's the oldest, uh, it's biggest, yeah, flea market, and it's in Paris. And um, it it was just yeah, absolutely amazing. I mean, I feel like any time a city has like a flea market, though, it's just like it's one of my favorite things to do because then it's like you're interacting with people, you're finding other people's treasures, like all of those things. So. That's like uh, I always find inspiration anytime I'm with, you know, vintage antique things as well. Well, I'd love um, to open it up. I'm sure there are many questions here and I, I can't read mine. So <laughs> I've, if anyone wants to um, ask questions, we'll open it up in just a second. But I did want to stress to definitely check out the Lavoon pop up outside. I mean, even if it's just stocking up for client gifts, it's like the ultimate I, what makes a house a home is you know, after the design, how it smells, who's there, all of that. So I, they're my favorite. Thank you. <laughs> please go check it out. No, but go do, please do um, go smell Lavoon candles because we are very, we're very proud of them. And, and you know, it was one of the first things that I feel like we have made. Um, we've made a lot of different products over the years. And it's one of the things that I feel like we, we took zero shortcuts on these. Everything from the experience of the box to the, the candle itself to all of the scents, like everything has been such a labor of love that we're so proud of. So I'd love for you to just like smell it just so that you can get a feel for, for what it is. Well, thank you both, mostly just for being thank so you. open and transparent and willing to share, you know, your journey and all of the lessons along the way. I know it's been helpful for me sitting here so <laughs> well thank you you and rue in general has been so supportive and lovely of our brand we love danny. everything that you do danny see danny more importantly yes <laughs> so everyone here so thank you so much for having thank us you very much yeah. Yeah. <laughs>